Hello. Good. <laughs> I'm going to talk about talk. Talk is something that we all do. It's maybe the first thing we learn, it's the last thing we lose. And you might already be skeptical and think, this thing, this ordinary thing that drives our everyday life, we don't think about it much, we just do it. Why do we need a science? And talk as an object of something for a scientist is kind of mundane in a way. So unlike a black hole, say, uh, a black hole doesn't exist in the first place to be understood by humans. Um, it is understood by physicists and, and so on. But talk only exists so that humans can live their lives. So we all do it, so why do we need a science of it? And we all think that communication and words and language is terribly important. And at the same time, we don't pay enough attention to it to really give it the rigor um, that it is due. So I'm going to talk to you about the science of talk, the science of conversation, and show you that there are big payoffs to understanding this most mundane of phenomena in a rigorous and scientific way. To start off with then, I'm going to very briefly give you Conversation Analysis 101, and then I'm going to talk about three separate things. First of all, we're going to see lots and lots of conversational openings, the first 10 seconds of a range of conversations. And then I'm going to walk you through some uh, research findings that shows how important one word is to changing the trajectory of an encounter. And then the final section is going to make you think about your own conversation and how good you are at conversation. And I'm going to show you some challenging, challenging situations and you can think about what you might do and say in those conversations and give yourself a little bit of a test to see what you've learned uh, in the lecture. So to start off with then, a conversation analysis 101 um, and what it is that I actually do as a conversation analyst. So we start off with recordings. We collect sometimes single, ten, hundreds, thousands of cases of talk and transcribe them in a lot of very fine-grained, prosodic, international detail. And then we try to understand the complete encounter from right from the opening hello all the way through to the end. And so I always get people at this stage in a lecture to think about conversation as having an architecture to it, like a racetrack, or you can think golf course if you prefer. So we start at the beginning of any encounter that we're in uh, with our recipient or recipient, uh, recipients, and then along the way we complete projects of various kinds. And so we might start with an opening, uh, a greeting, and then we might, if we're th at the doctor's say, then we move into the why we're here today, and then the doctor might move into the question and answer part, and then there might be some diagnosis and some recommendations and so on. And if we're at the supermarket checkout, then the racetrack is comprised of different sorts of activities, but they're quite regular. And if we're on a first date, it turns out um, that when you study lots of first dates, uh, that they're also comprised of quite systematically organised activities. And one of the reasons that we don't know that much about talk scientifically is because we think that talk is very idiosyncratic, that we're all individuals driven by our personalities or our age or our gender or our culture, those kinds of factors that we just readily reach to. And we think that talk is too messy to study. It can't be systematic because it's just so disorganised. Um, but in fact, when you look at lots and lots of examples of the same type of encounter and sort of take a step back and look at the overall architecture or landscape of conversations, it turns out that they're quite robust and talk is actually much more systematically structured and highly organised in ways that we are n not really aware of uh, and I'm going to show you some of examples of, of those things. So the first 10 seconds then of some conversations. The, the very first clip that I'm going to show you is simply two friends on the phone saying hello. Now you're going to see this call and all of the rest of the conversations that I'm going to play come out line by line in sync with the audio. So that will enable you to live through the real encounter as it actually happened, which is how we experience any conversation. You don't quite know what's going to happen next until the person says it. And you're also going to see as the transcript unfolds that the transcript has dots and dashes and squiggles on it, um, standard punctuation marks, but in this system, 
uh, refer to phonetic features of talk. So it's a system a bit like musical notation. Um, you don't need to know it in a lot of detail now because you're going to hear it, but, but the dots and dashes, they mean something in the transcription system that we use. So to start off with then, this, this very ordinary telephone call. And I would say that if you don't understand what's going on in this saying hello start of a telephone call, then you need some help. <laughs> so see me later. Okay, this one is really simple. You should understand it straight away. Okay. So here they come. They're Hyla and Nancy. It's old-fashioned telephone. Uh, they're American, and this is the start of their conversation. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Okay, that's it. Nothing hard to understand yet, okay? Hopefully. So each time I play a clip, you're going to see line numbers so that we can point things out, and then you'll see the name of the speaker. Uh, sometimes they'll be anonymized depending on the type of material it is. And then, as you can see, um, we have what they've said with the dots and dashes and squiggles. And you probably all heard the difference between the hello, answering the phone, and the hi at line three when uh, Nancy realizes that she recognizes the person on the end of the phone. Some more things about this first 10 seconds of this first encounter. And one of them is how rapid it is. So less than a tenth of a second between the spoken turns. Really rapid. Something else about it is that they do things reciprocally. They both do greetings, they both recognize each other, and they're both starting to do these how are yous. Okay, very recognizable. You have done this many times yourself this evening. I've heard you. <laughs> the hi, hi, hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Fine. And you've all kind of done that tonight. So it's rapid and it's <laughs> reciprocal. And this pattern that just kicks off very ordinary, everyday conversations is also recurrent across different settings. Now, sometimes people say to me, well, OK, but what about, what about on Skype, for instance, or, or these new ways of, of, of interacting? Um, so the next clip is me and my dad, um, my dad's sister. My aunt is sitting over there in the audience. Um, so this is my dad and me on Skype starting a conversation. Hi, Liz. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? OK, so there we, we are doing it. Uh, and then, what about on Facebook Messenger or, or, or something like that when you're writing? So here are people on Facebook Messenger. This is going a bit more slowly because they're typing and it takes longer. But hey, Myra, how are you? Hey, you. And then typing, typing. I'm not too bad, thanks. Typing, typing, typing. You. So there it all is. Uh, and we can see that it's recurrent and rapid and reciprocal. And both parties are doing uh, all of these components that start a conversation. So I'm going to also sh now show you, so you've already seen Hyla and Nancy, and you're going to see those characters in a couple of other conversations. The next one is between Hyla and her boyfriend, Richard. And this time, I just want you to watch for how many times they say to each other, hello, how many times they initiate the how are you's, because it's going to happen a lot. And what I want you to just understand from this extract, which is much longer, is it's it's there is an imperative to do these opening features of a conversation, such that they're not going to move on until they've managed to successfully do these features, the hellos, the how are yous, and so on. So here comes uh, Hyla and this time Richard. You. <laughs> Besides out of breath. Uh, fine. I was just about to hang up. <laughs> I just got home. I figured that. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> oh, I love driving up to the door. Yeah. And hearing the, no. How are you? I I'm fine. Good. I'm fine. Good. <laughs> okay. So uh, now you're starting to appreciate what real talk looks like when you transcribe it in all of its messy gorgeousness. Um, and, and in this particular 30 lines uh, of, the, of the conversation, um, we have 
six hellos or highs, three how are you's and three fines. So you can see it's important to people to get all of these things calibrated. And so it's something like akin to, you, you can start like Hyla and Nancy did at the start of the racetrack, and then you move around the encounter together. Or you can start like this, where you're kind of bumping along, you know, the rumble strips at the edge of the, of the motorway, and you're kind of bumping along, and it's going to take a while, and then finally you're both getting on, and now you're going to move smoothly through the interaction, and it's a bit like that. And there's one other detail here that I just want you to notice, if you haven't noticed it already, and that is what happens just about here, which is the end of the start of an argument. So just here, Richard had started to say, oh, I love driving up to the door and hearing the foot. No, mm -hmm. I won't go there. I won't complain about you making me race to the door. Um, I'll just do what belongs here, which is a how are you. I haven't done the reciprocal one yet, so I'll do it now. Okay, now then, just as a little aside, because you might find this kind of thing interesting and it's what we can sometimes capture when we study conversation, uh, here is a moment between Richard and Hyla a little bit later in the call where he basically says that he was going to call her, um, but she's obviously already called him. I don't know if you can just about hear that. He says, I was going to call you, yeah, but I feel great that you call me. And she says, I don't, I'm desperate, in other words, to hear from you. And the fact is that this relationship is not really going very well. And Richard has, in fact, told her that he's not going to come this weekend to visit her. And this is going to unfold itself in the call. And after this call, Hyla then phones uh, her friend Nancy again. And she's clearly phoned Richard on more than one occasion and then bottled it when he's answered the phone and put the phone down. But now she's telling her friend that she did this terrible thing last night. You know what I did last night? What? I did a terrible thing. I called Richard. Yeah, and I hung up on the answer. Oh, hi, why? Okay, so a little, a little nice moment between friends in, in the soap opera of the data that conversation analysts sometimes study. <coughs> Okay, now there is a point to all of this. Apart from getting you used to seeing some data and seeing this remarkable systematicity in the way we open telephone calls, but you might be thinking, yeah, but all this how are you stuff, it doesn't really, it doesn't, we don't really mean it when we say how are you at the start of a telephone call. You're not really meant to say anything important when someone says how are you in that casual way at the start of a telephone call. And so it's sort of pointless. It's, it's just filler talk. Uh, why is it there? Well... The answer to that question is, when it isn't there, you really notice it. So if you want to tell someone that you're annoyed with them, then you just drop doing the how are you's at the start of the conversation. And if you want to tell someone that you're really, really annoyed with them, then you don't say hello. And this is what we're going to see now. So this is now Debbie and Shelley, and they are going to start 10 rounds of argument but, but you're going to tell that from the first 10 seconds. District Truth Office. Shelley. Gabby. <laughs> I'm hoping that you can tell they're going to have an argument now. And that's because the apparently pointless stuff is totally dispensed with in this call. We're just going straight for argument. And we know this because of those features which are rapid and recurrent and reciprocal are now absent. And so we'll just see a little more moment. And they're basically about to have an argument because one of them has ditched the other one for, for a date and has cancelled the arrangement that they had together. What is the deal? What do you mean? You're not going to go? Okay, so, but we could tell that this was just going to unfold because of what didn't happen at the start of this call. And here is uh, one more example like that. This time, it's Gordon answering the phone. Hello? And he doesn't know what's going to happen next, uh, but we do when we see this. So at line two, we have seven-tenths of a second of silence. And that is all we need to know that there is trouble ahead for Gordon <laughs> because of what we've seen already. So we know that when things are just progressing in a no-problem, smooth type of way, things are happening rapidly and reciprocally. And here we have something that is neither rapid and not immediately reciprocal. So something is going to happen. So 
conversation analysts can predict the future. Uh, we know that something interestingly different is going to happen at line three. So we're not expecting uh, the, the Heidi and Nancy straightforward kind of conversation or that me and my dad were expecting something else. So let's see what it is. And it turns out that it's Gordon's girlfriend, Dana, on the phone. Hello, where have you been all morning? So imagine what it would take for Dana to communicate one notch up the argument scale or how irritated I am scale. All she would need to do is drop the hello and go straight to where have you been all morning? So the fact that there's a hello there tells us that she's, you know, she's not maxed out on irritation, but she's on that scale because she's doing the hello, but she's not doing the how are you's, the apparently pointless how are you's that we now see they have a role. They have a function which is to say this is a no problem conversation that we're about to have, uh, but in fact um, this, is, this is not one of those. Now, Gordon has options at this point. So if any of you are seeking advice on how to not have an argument, I'm going to show you how to avoid an argument at this point. And the way to avoid the argument here, uh, which Gordon is going to do, is, is not say something like, what do you mean, where have I been all morning? We're not married, I don't need to tell you. So he doesn't do that. He could do that, though. He could be straight into that kind of conversation. But he's going to do what belongs here, which is that reciprocal, recognitional, hi, so he's going to do what belongs on the racetrack as a way of pushing back on the argument that he could nevertheless, he could be in otherwise. Hello. So I'll just do one of those because that's what belongs here. So if you're in a conversation with someone who comes up to you and says something rude or whatever it is, then, then a really good response is to just say, hello. And then they might get the point. All right. Now, we know that silence here at line two it tells us something. We already have uh, an, an idiom that silence speaks volumes, and we know something interesting about silence and what it's doing in conversation. So we know to expect some problem if we say, you know, do you love me? And there isn't a, re a really rapid response coming next. Uh, so to give you an example of this, this is from the film The Duchess. Um, you might have seen it. It's the, um, the, the biography of uh, Georgiana Cavendish talking to Charles Gray of Earl Grey tea uh, fame with whom she's having an affair. And basically, she's just going to ask him, do you think of me when we are not, not together? Do you think of me when we're not together? You ought to know I do. You hesitated before you replied. OK, so, so we all know this. And yet, it's actually a, a more common thing for people to think, oh, you know, turns aren't that rapid, you know, silences are normal between turns of talk because people are thinking about things or we, our brains need time to process. But when you study real conversation, you can see that people are very, very rapidly processing, if you like, the, the things that other people are saying and we can respond uh, very rapidly to conversation and that idea of kind of brain processing isn't really held up by, by the empirical analysis of talk. OK, now, of course, what we've seen so far are conversations between people who are friends or partners and they know each other, and where the, the how we use are calibrating something about that relationship. If we are in a conversation with the doctor or we phone the bank, then we don't really do the how we use. And in fact, it's also incredibly irritating. And um, this happened to me earlier today when somebody phoned up uh, from the car sales showroom that I'd bought my car from a few years ago. And they said, and I did, but I didn't know who it was. And I answered the phone cautiously, hello. And they said, hello, how are you today? And I thought, oh God, it's a salesperson. Uh, and I know this because I don't know who it is. And they've asked me how I am today, um, which is a bit of a giveaway. And I know this isn't, uh, this isn't really belonging in this encounter. And I didn't reciprocate. So I didn't, it didn't work to build rapport with me. But I just want to show you one more example of, again, the sort of the imperative to get the hellos all sorted at the start of an encounter so that you can get onto the racetrack and then move around it smoothly together. So this is a call um, between a, 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 a mum, a parent of a student at clearing time. 
So you may or may not know or remember about clearing. We're in a university. Um, I'm not, I guess most people aren't coming to Cambridge through clearing. But nevertheless, uh, this, this is uh, a situation where uh, the student may or may not have the grades to get onto the, to the degree programme that they have an offer for. And so the mum is now phoning up um, to see whether her daughter is still going to get onto the economics course. But really what I just want you to notice again is how messy talk is, and yet its messiness is kind of <coughs> over the top of an underpinning systematic structure, which we're going to see evident here again by the number of times both parties say hello, and they are not prepared to dispense with sorting the hellos out and move on until they've both managed to get a recognised, receipted hello. Good afternoon, University Contact Centre speaking. Hello. 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 I'm, I'm, hello. I'm calling up on behalf of my daughter, who is away at the moment, but she just had a level result. Okay, and it goes on. Uh, but again, just notice how many hellos and how messy it all looks, but they're not going to move on um, to the bi main business of the call until somehow we both know that we've heard that opening, important greeting. But no how are you's here, not relevant. My final couple of examples of the first 10 seconds of a conversation come from a completely different situation. And now we start to get a sense of the importance of studying talk in this way. Because these are recordings of police negotiations with suicidal persons in crisis. And this is a situation where one can really perhaps appreciate that every single word that comes out of your mouth is crucial. Because every time the negotiator says something to the person in crisis they are, of course, trying to get the person in crisis to keep talking and keep taking turns. And every time they manage to get the person in crisis to say something, then that person is choosing life. They're choosing to not jump. They're choosing to keep taking a turn. So what works and what is effective to get a person in crisis to keep taking turns? So I'm going to show you the start of... Again, uh, an encounter, not quite at the start, um, but near the start of uh, a recorded uh, negotiation made at the scene. And it's on the phone because quite often the negotiators establish phone contact with the person who may be on a roof, maybe at some distance. And the thing that I'm trying to do, again, as a conversation analyst is study sometimes settings that really matter, or at least we can sort of see the import of these settings. And then what I'm identifying is the tacit expertise that people have, but they don't really know they have, so that we can build training and guidance that is based on uh, research rather than people's best guess at what might be effective in communication. So you're going to see my identification of practice that doesn't work and then some practice that does work. And you'll see it working and not working yourselves. And this is really important because in, a, in, in this situation, but, but like any conversation, but here it's just very clear, the negotiator doesn't have the option of not trying again. So if they start something with the person in crisis, they can't just stop if it doesn't work immediately. They have to keep going. They have to keep taking turns. So we're going to see the start of a negotiation that doesn't work, and then we'll see the negotiator have another go, and it's going to work. And so what I can do is then identify, okay, this is the, this is the practice that worked. And of course, you know, if, if people knew or could reflect easily on what they did and knew what worked, then people would just do the right thing all the time, right? So we clearly don't know what we're doing necessarily that works because if we did, then we wouldn't need any research and we wouldn't even need any training and everything would be perfect. So we clearly don't know what we're doing that works and, and also we don't know sometimes what we're doing that, that doesn't work and sometimes the things that we are doing, not only don't they work, but they're also in the guidance so we're learning the wrong things as well. So here comes the start uh, of, of a negotiation um, on the phone. You're going to see the, the person in crisis answer their phone, and the negotiator is going to say, Hello, Kevin, it's Steve. Thanks for putting your phone back on. Hello? Hi. 
Thanks for uh, putting your phone back on. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a bit more about this PC because it's obviously, it's, I mean, it's something that's very important to you, it's important to me. Okay, so the voices sound a little bit strange, I've anonymized them. Uh, and you can see that, I'm hoping that you can see here, that there's quite a lot of stuff uh, in lines two to six that the negotiator is saying. So unlike everything else that we've seen before, you've seen turn, 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 whereas here you've got an opening uh, hello and then quite a lot of stuff. So there is not a lot of space there, if you like, for the person in crisis to come back uh, and do anything. And then at line seven, nothing happens. This is a, a, a small micro pause. And so the negotiator is going to add a little bit more. Find out what's going on. So I'm going to add a little bit more to the thing that I'm trying to do to engage you to talk. And then nothing happens. And then there's a little noise. And then... <laughs> So whatever has happened here, inside the natural laboratory provided by these recordings, the impact of, or the effect of what happened at lines two to eight is inside this encounter. It didn't work to get the person talking. And it's interesting because some of the things that are in the negotiator's talk are the sorts of things that you might get trained to say like an appreciation, thanks for putting your phone back on. We, we must do those appreciative things. Um, saying that what you do and think is important to me. Um, but it's also kind of difficult to say uh, what is, that the negotiator is gonna articulate what's important to the person in crisis, because they don't know them. So maybe they're not really entitled to say it, things are obviously important to you because you don't really know the person yet. But whatever, this is not working to get the person talking. So let's have a look uh, at what does, because at line 11, when the person in crisis hangs up, the negotiator can't stop. They have to have another go. That's their job. They have to try again. Hello. Hello. Can you tell me a bit more about PC so I can do something about it? OK, now you can see that this is very different. It's much shorter. And... It doesn't say anything like, thank you very much for putting your phone back on. It doesn't say anything about the negotiator's feelings uh, toward the person in crisis. It seems quite direct. It seems less friendly. It's also a yes-no question. Can you tell me? Yes or no? And certainly in some communication training, maybe not all, just this training, but in general, we, we tend to learn things like, yes-no questions are bad. They're evil. They close the conversation down. We all think we know about a yes-no question. Um, but we also really do know that yes-no questions don't necessarily close things down. So if I say to you, have you got the time, please, and you said yes, and that was the end of it, that would be quite weird. So we do know that grammatically yes-no questions carry all sorts of functions in their form. So here we have an apparently bad question, a yes-no question, a closed question. It doesn't sound very friendly. And it doesn't have any sort of care in it or, or et cetera. But in fact, it is what is going to get the person talking. Six months ago, there was a empire at a court injunction to come in the house. OK. And um, PC was supposed to attend it. OK. You don't really need to worry about the PC North story, but the point that I'm hoping you're seeing here is that now we can see something that got the person in crisis talking. And now we've got something to show to negotiators, which is what I've done, so that they can see that this type of question, um, which doesn't ask the person to talk, and doesn't say anything about caring for them, and it doesn't try to build rapport with them, and it doesn't appreciate putting the phone back on. It's, it's a more direct, sort things out, action-oriented question, and it's what actually gets the person in crisis talking. So we can start to build training by looking at what actually works, and also start to pull out the tacit expertise that these negotiators do have, but, but can't articulate it uh, in a way that I can art articulate it for them. Are you all with me so far? Good. So let's move on now to the second section and look at cases where words really make a difference. So the first clip that I'm going to play comes from a recording of uh, a telephone call from a neighbour in dispute 
to a community mediation service. So I've done lots and lots of work on neighbour disputes and lots of work on what happens when somebody has a neighbour dispute and they phone somewhere for help. And if you have a neighbour dispute, you might phone the police because you would like your neighbour to be arrested, or you might phone the council because you'd like them to be evicted, or you might phone environmental health because you would like your neighbour to have a noise abatement order or something like that. Um, you, they're the kinds of places that we, or, that we phone. And all of those things tell you what kind of thing people want when they've got a neighbour dispute, which is basically, yeah, arrest them, evict them, just kill them, we just don't want to live with them. And so the problem is that when people phone a mediation service and they're offered this talk-based solution, let's get you both together and see if we can facilitate, you know, the sorting out the differences, people don't really want that because they already know that they're right and their neighbour is horrible. I'm the lovely one and they're horrible. I'm the reasonable one and they're horrible. So mediation is a tough sell. So I got very interested in how is it that when people telephone community mediation services, so many of them end up saying no. And it can't be about cost because it's mostly free. So what are the points of engagement and disengagement in those calls? I'm going to show you just one observation from this research. So again, I want you to imagine you know, hundreds of telephone calls into different community mediation services and what the overall landscape or uh, racetrack looks like. And what happens is people phone up and... They generally start by saying something like, hello, uh, I've just been given the police and they've given me your number. Or, I've just phoned the council and they've put me on to you. So they don't phone up and say, hello, I'd like to make an appointment with a mediator, please. I, in fact, don't have any cases like that. So people don't phone up to make an appointment. They phone up because they've been given the number by some other service and the other service that they phone tells you the kind of thing that they were after in the first place, which is, if you've just phoned the police, then you wanted them arrested. If you've just phoned the council, you wanted them, you know, you wanted something to happen. So that's what happens first, and then they explain the problem, and then the mediator explains what mediation is, because they have to. So unlike phoning your GP, you don't have a moment when you're phoning your GP to make an appointment where the receptionist says, let me tell you a bit about GP practices and what doctors do, because we all know that. But in mediation calls, that is what happens. So we have an explanation of mediation, and that is one of the points of divergence, if you like. If, if mediators explain it this particular way, uh, then you get engagement. And if they explain it in another way, then you start to see disengagement. But putting the explanations to one side for a moment, I just want to bring you to the end of the call. And of course, neither party know they're in the end of the call yet, but I do because I have the whole recording and we're, we're really at the end of the call. And the only thing that happens after this clip is an appointment is made. So let's see what happens here. And the mediator, having heard the problem and explained mediation, is now going to say, does that sound like it might be helpful to you? Does that sound like it might be helpful to you? Okay, so... You hopefully now already know enough conversation analysis to know that the answer is, <laughs> your silence speaks volumes, you know that probably the answer is no. Now, we're going to see a no, and again, I will refer you back to the, the thing that I said right at the start of my encounter, which is that this person is not going to just say no, but they're going to take a lot of words to say no. And if you don't understand that all of these words amount to no then again, you might need some help with your everyday conversation. So this is what no looks like, and I hope you can all see that this is no. So the caller's going to come back and say no. Well, it might be, but um, I'm not too sure at this stage about, you know, how long seeing this girl yeah. at all. That's no. Uh, it, we say no with a delay, um, that, so we're indicating our upcoming unlikely... Uh, yes, and then we do a bit of more delay, hesitations, and appreciation. It might be, but, and then uh, an account. I don't really want to see this girl uh, at this stage or at all. Now, again, the mediator could give up at this point. They could just say, okay, then, and give up. And that's what happens sometimes. So some mediators don't know that there is actually something magic that they can do next to get this person to go from no to yes. 
And it's a shame that they don't know about it because this is a really common way out of mediation. Something, something a bit like this, where basically the caller will start to talk about the other person and they'll start to talk about them as the kind of person that you can't talk to or I don't want to see this person at all. And they start to negatively characterise the other party, which of course is entirely consistent for them because they're lovely and the other party's horrible. So this is a slot where you can start to see she might start talking about this girl. I don't really want to talk to this girl. Now, the mediator is going to come back and take another turn. And I want you to watch out for the point where the caller starts to respond, because this is really crucial. So this is why we need this detailed transcript. You're going to notice that they talk in overlap at the same time. So watch for the point where the caller starts to apparently have a radical rethink and say yes. OK? Yeah, but you'd be willing to see two of our mediators oh, of just course. to talk yeah. about it all. Yeah, definitely. So around about here is where the caller starts to produce, oh, of course, yeah, yeah, definitely. So what has the mediator done here? And, and also, maybe crucially, how much has the caller heard such that she knows that she's absolutely now on board with this? And the answer is that the mediator has not asked a question, but stated, you'd be willing to see two of our... She doesn't know what she's been asked or proposed that she's willing to do, but she knows that she's the willing type. Because she's the, she's the nice one. The other one is not the willing type. The other one is the kind of person you can't talk to. Or she, you won't get her to mediate. But you must be the kind that will then. And that's what we can see working here. And we see it especially because of this position of the overlap here, because she doesn't know what she's been asked that she's, or proposed that, that she's willing to do. So we have this, this dramatic turnaround. So it turns out that willing works in all the cases that we then went and looked for, not just then in community mediation, we went and looked in, in other mediation, and in other settings entirely. And I gave a talk a bit like this to a room full of medics back in April. And on the second day of, of the conference, uh, one of the audience came up to me with his laptop and said, I want to show you something. And I thought, OK. And he basically showed me a stream of emails between him and his manager. And the manager wanted the uh, medic to start a new way of doing something with, uh, well, it doesn't really matter what, but some, some, some new way of doing something with patients. And he wanted it to be dispersed across the entire NHS trust in, in one go. And the medic wanted them to do a, a, a QI methodology, small and local, see if it worked, and then uh, spread it out. So, you know, something tried and tested. But the manager, no, no, want, you know, culture change, want to have a big splash, do it, you know, and you could almost... Perhaps, I don't know if this is true, but I could sort of hear, yes, this is a manager with an appraisal coming who wants to tick. I did huge culture change. So I, I want to do it the way in, across. And I'm ignoring the recommendation to do it in this small-scale way. So overnight, the medic had written, would you be willing to meet the team who do the, the QI methodology? Sure. Instant turnaround. And I actually felt like a witch. I thought, oh, my God, you know, what, I, I've, I've told people about this word, and now they're going to use it everywhere in, in, a, in a dangerous way. Uh, and then I got an email uh, last week from this guy saying that they, they adopted the QI methodology and they instigated the change in a sensible way, and that, that felt good. Uh, and so, so these, this, this happens to work in situations where you want somebody to, at the same time as saying yes, it gives them an opportunity to be the nice one. So unlike, does it sound helpful, you can say yes or no to that without it really being about you. But if you ask someone if they're willing to do something, then their answer is a bit about them. Now, just so that you don't go off in dangerous ways with this new power that you have, um, <laughs> it, it's probably not a good idea to say to your partner or your kid, would you be willing to put the bins out? It's a bit heavy. <laughs> But if you've been in a bad relationship for a long time and you want your partner to go to relate, would you be willing to go to relate? That, that's a sensible place to use it. After resistance uh, and where it gives the person the opportunity to also say yes, but also I'm the nice one, I'm, I'm the moral one. And, and basically that's what this does. It opens up a slot for the caller to do what they want to do, which is to say I'm the nice one. And it happens to fit with the goal of getting the client. So willing makes a difference. Now we're going to go back to negotiation 
and see some more examples of words that make a difference in these trying to get the person in crisis to talk. So let's see some examples of trying to get the person in crisis simply to take turns. I need to try and find a way to get you those cigarettes. In the meantime, can we talk about how you are? Okay. In the meantime, can we talk about how you are? What's the answer? You already know the answer, so we see the delay and then we see a no. No, I don't want to talk. And even through the anonymization, I hope that you can hear, and I'll play it again, the way the person in crisis says, talk. No, I don't want to talk. No, I don't want to talk. So putting some emphasis on the word. The suggestion is about talking, and I don't want to talk. And let's see how this one carries on. You either bring me when you've got the fucking cigarettes, or don't bother. OK, what's, what's going to happen when we get the cigarettes home? OK, so what is it about this word here? Can we talk about how you are and then this sort of ironising of the word talk? I don't want to talk. Maybe the, the answer to this problem is in the next clip, uh, again, from another negotiation. And here, you, just, you don't need to know much context, but you'll see what they're doing when, when they are objecting uh, to the, this idea of, of talking to the negotiator. You kept saying earlier about actions rather than words. This is, this is genuine action that we can oh, give you. Know, Why don't you think okay, it... We ain't done anything. So, there's a problem with the word talk. And the problem with the word talk is that it's not action. And we have loads of idioms in English for talk not really doing anything. You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. And some of these things are also in popular culture all the time. Uh, and they're also in all the languages that I have friends and colleagues. So the idea that actions speak louder than words is a really familiar idiom. And it turns out that when negotiators ask persons in crisis to talk, it opens up a slot for idioms about the pointlessness of talking to fly into the interaction and that's what happens. So here's another example going back to mediation. So you can start to see the connection now between different settings. And here you've got, again, got somebody with a neighbour dispute. And the mediator is proposing talk as a solution to the problem. But the problem with the word talk is that it opens up a slot for idioms to fly in about the pointlessness of talking. So here's another example, and in this one, uh, the caller is basically obviously on the phone to the mediator, but has also got a leaflet about mediation, and she's, she's reading out and saying, you know, it, it says on your leaflet you don't really give advice. So she's trying to understand what is this mediation thing that, that we're talking about. And the mediator is going to come back and say what mediation is, uh, and it's a talk-based solution. You see, because it does say on yours, like, you don't really give advice. No, no. Um, it's really to help you both to um, sort it out between yourselves. Which do you uh, mean? Yeah, they're not the talking. Either. Okay. So you can probably predict what kind of thing is going to come next. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've done all that. There's no point in talking to them because it's like talking to the wall. So again, what we have here is talk opens up slots for people to resist talking. So if you want to engage people in mediation or in crisis negotiation, then we need another word for talk to get them to talk. So what is another word for talk that might get people to talk? Let's see if you are right. And again, I want to find this in the material. I don't want to guess at it. Words are too important for me to make a guess, hazard a guess at the word that might work, but we're going to see it working in the negotiation. I know I want to come down and I want to speak to you. And yes, see if I was so scared. Myself. I said myself wouldn't make it now. I know, I know. Yeah. You must have been so frightened. So, again, these, oh, these brackets here, which tell us when people are talking at the same time, it's really rapidly after the word speak occurs, the speak that that the person in crisis starts talking. And the thing is, we don't have idioms about speak in the same way. We don't say actions speak louder than speak. 
talk is, speak is cheap. We, we just, they're not the same. And so speak does not open up the slots for that type of resistance. And I don't mean that every time you say talk, people resist it, and every time people say speak, they start talking. But what we're after are, the, are these, these tilts towards a better outcome and closing down obvious slots for resistance. And just here's one more example. This time um, where you see, again, this nice endogenous evidence like we saw um, with the person in crisis saying, you ain't done anything. You know, it's just, you're not, the talking isn't really doing anything. And it's kind of in what they're doing as well. And here, speak is also uh, inside the encounter from the point of view of the, of the participants themselves. You said for the sake of your children, why don't you come down for them? You want to speak to who? Stephanie's officer. OK. So again, uh, we have some evidence here that the person in crisis does not ask to talk. They ask to speak. And we would not know this if we didn't look at real recordings of, of people doing this, because we tend not to think that words are that important in the end. So I'm a psychologist by background, and it is amazing how much psychology, which is the science of behavior, does not study behavior. What psychologists do is they simulate behavior. They, run ex they, they experimentally produce behavior. They interview people about behavior. They survey people about behavior. But they don't look at the actual behavior. And what I'm hoping you're starting to see is it's really quite important to look at the actual behavior. Because if I say to a room full of negotiators, is it better to say speak or talk? They're pretty likely to choose talk. It sounds nicer. It sounds friendlier. Now, we can think about all the reasons why speak and talk make a difference. And I've shown you that speak does not provide for the same possibilities of resistance. I'm actually less interested in the whys. I want to show that things happen and how things happen, and that those things are systematic, and then let the practitioners decide to use the practices that they now see work or not. But we need to study talk, because again, in a nine-hour negotiation, are you going to remember that talk was less effective than speak at getting someone to talk? And the answer has to be no, otherwise people would say speak all the time. They would just know that already, and we wouldn't have the, these kinds of observations. OK, one more then, just to bring all this together uh, before your test, which is coming up. Uh, and it's again, it's from the negotiation. And, uh, the negotiation and, and here the negotiator is doing something that they're absolutely not meant to do if you read the training literature and, and, and the research. Well, you can just go back to the station. No, I can't. How can I do that? You know how it works. I can't do that, can I? I have to stand here with you. So, counter to the, you know, recommendations to build rapport and say how much you care about people, here the negotiator decides to say, I've just got to be here. You know, because sometimes the persons in crisis say things like, you don't really care about me, you're just, it's just your job. And they try very hard to say, no, 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 I genuinely care. Here the strategy is to say, yeah, but I've just got to be here. And, and let's see how this unfolds. But you're telling me you're not trying to piss me off? Very long silence. Feels like you are. It feels like you just want to upset me. She's just breaking all the rules. <laughs> Will you come down? There's that verb again. Watch your step, mate. Watch your step. OK. And, and rather neatly, uh, now the person in crisis is, is going to come down. After the, the, the productive challenge that does not find its way into training, um, and there's that verb again. All right, so finally then, how good is your conversation? I'm going to show you, uh, let's see how much time we have, 10 minutes or so left, so we get through these clips. So in the negotiations that you've been seeing, uh, I've already given you this idea that it, it's like a, a spiral. I do like my metaphors. We're not, this isn't the racetrack, this is the spiral. And at the top of the spiral of negotiation is the person in crisis, the negotiator, and life. And at the bottom of the spiral is the person in crisis, the negotiator, and death. And across a long negotiation, you get moves up the spiral and down the spiral. 
And so what we're after is what kinds of things does the negotiator say that keep the person taking turns, that is each turn is, is bringing them up the spiral? And what do they say that leads to them rapidly going down the spiral? And in these negotiations, we, we sort of have to accept that they're going to take a long time. Because if you've done something like st stand on a roof and threaten to jump, if a negotiation, the negotiator turns up and says, we'd, we'd really like it to come down, you can't just say, OK, then. That's because we, that's not how negotiation works. It's, it's going to take time. And if you just think of a very simple example, which is not like this at all, but if, if you've said today, right, I'm not eating cake today, and you've, you've basically told your, your family, your colleagues, I'm not eating cake today. And then at four o'clock, someone comes around with cake. And they say, do you want some cake? No, 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 no. Are you sure? You do a little bit of silence, and then you say, mm, go on then. It takes time to change your mind. And in, this, is, this is not cake. This is life and death. So these negotiations are necessarily long and complex. But it does mean that we can also see cycles of up and down. Now, in these negotiation cells or units, we have a first negotiator, the primary negotiator, whose job it is to talk to the person in crisis. But there are other people relevant to the scene. So there is also a second negotiator. And their job is to support the primary negotiator. And by support, I mean everything from physically supporting the negotiator. So let's say that the negotiator is in a cherry picker crane because they need to talk to somebody who is on a roof. And so the negotiator two's role might be to physically support the primary negotiator. Um, but it can also include encouragement, like keep, keep going. Uh, and it can include things to say, say, say please, or whatever. So that they have that role. And then there are also um, other people around. So there are negotiators three and four who are there to communicate information to and from the scene. And then members of the public might just be in the street as well or, or in the location. And then family members, friends and so on might be called to help out. N2, you could argue, is the most trainable person in the unit because... Their job, in a way, is to analyse live, not like a conversation analyst, but as an expert negotiator, the conversation that is happening between N1 and the person in crisis. So their job is to basically see what's going on, and if they're going to suggest things for the negotiator one to say, then they are the person that you want to most help because they, you don't want them to be saying things that derail the negotiation. Because it's all you, you already know how hard it is to you know you're talking on the phone to somebody, and you know your partner or someone's like saying tell them tell them it's Monday, and you're like shut up. Um, so so it's already quite hard to have two conversations at once, um, and this is the situation though that is happening with these these negotiators. So I want you to put yourself in the role of N2, and it's your job to advise N1 what to say. We're going to see a, a clip where N2 is going to do exactly that, and we'll see what happens. So we're about an hour in to the negotiation, and we don't know the person in crisis's name yet. And they want to get names of persons in crisis for various reasons, um, but let's just see what happens here. What do you want me to call you? Why should I call you my name? Yeah? Okay, so... What do you want me to call you? Some resistance from the person in crisis. Why should I tell you my name, yeah? And now the N2 is going to make a suggestion for the kind of thing that the N1 could do to overcome this resistance. And at the same time, the N1 is going to do something that they presumably hope is going to overcome this resistance. And neither party are listening to what has actually been resisted at line three. And it's interesting that when I present these materials to negotiators of various types, some of them do not see what actually happened in those first, first two turns. And so we can all talk about listening skills, and everyone thinks listening is terribly important, but God, a lot of people do not listen. Not really, not for action, not for what people are doing when they're talking. So I'm hoping that some of you have noticed that 
the negotiator has not asked for the name. They've asked, what do you want me to call you? They haven't actually asked for the person in crisis's name. And it's amazing how many people did not hear that. And so if you didn't hear that, then your advice is going to be wrong. Because decent advice might be something like, you don't need to tell me your name, just something I can call you. Or, you, you know, I don't want your whole name, just, just your first name is fine. Something reassuring of the person in crisis that we don't want your full name for whatever reason you might be worried about giving us your name. They didn't ask for the name. I don't know how many of you, I won't, I won't do a show and tell, but I'm guaranteeing that some of you did not notice that. So let's see what happens next. I told you my name. Because I care for you. Because I care for you. I care for you. OK, so the negotiator one has also not quite heard what was potentially effective, and they've lost, they've lost it already because they do not pursue uh, the call. They've asked about calling you, and they haven't stuck with that themselves. And then the second negotiator, somewhere in this, this mess of overlapping talk, say, say it's because I care for you. Now, I'm hoping that you can, again, all see that, why should I tell you my name, yeah? Because I care for you are not things that are fitted together. They just don't fit together. And at line 10 here, the negotiator is going to sort of insist that you, ne the first negotiator does put this into the, into the conversation by repeating it. So say it's because I care for you at line 7, because I care for you again at line 10. And then at line 12, the negotiator 1 puts that line into the live negotiation. And again, I'm hoping that the eagle-eyed amongst you have noticed something interesting about the eventual instantiation of that line, which is that the N1 dispenses with the word because. So even in the moment, the first negotiator has realized that I can't say because I care for you, because that doesn't really fit next to why should I tell you my name? Because I care for you. They don't go together. So now they're in the position of having to put the line in, but they drop the because because it's not really because. And now they're starting some new, strange, I care for you. Where, where, where's that going? Uh, and then let's just see how this finishes up. If I didn't care for you, I wouldn't be here, would I? You're not listening to me. OK, so who's listening uh, and who isn't listening? Yeah. So the N2 here is really crucial, because here the N2 could have done something really helpful by you know, getting the N1 to focus on the thing that they originally did. And then you know, by the time we get down here, we're, the, P, the PIC is just still in the same place, and we haven't moved forward. And in fact, we've, we've lost some ground. OK, two more examples, and then we're done. So in this one, we've got a 911 call, 999 in the UK, 911, American call. And it's an interesting call. Let's see what you make of this. Ma'am, you've got one. one. Yeah. Don't you see it all yet? 911, operator 901, where's the emergency? 127, been there. Okay, what's going on there? I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. <laughs> okay, now, this is a case in which none of the words uttered mean the thing that is going on. So... You, there's all sorts of implications for that. Uh, but one of them is something like, when you can't say the words, any of the words that are actually important, how do you nevertheless communicate to somebody something important that isn't really about a pizza? Ma'am, you've reached 911. This is an emergency line. Uh, large with half pepperoni, half mushroom. Now, about here something especially interesting is going on. So where the caller here at 14 comes back and says, yeah, as though she's still in this conversation ordering a pizza, she's timing that response in a very particular kind of way. And what she's doing is something like, I want you to hear that I'm pretending to have a conversation with you about pizza. And why might somebody want the... 911 dispatcher to hear that I'm pretending to have a conversation with you about pizza. Yeah. So already you're figuring out 
slowly <laughs> what it is that the, also the emergency dispatcher is also going to slowly figure out because the, pers the caller doesn't have the words. They can't use any of the words that is going to communicate that this is not about pizza by talking only about pizza. Okay, let's see a little bit more. And the moment of realization. Um, you know you've called 911. This is an emergency line. Do you know how long it'll be? Okay, ma'am, is everything okay over there? Do you have an emergency or not? Yes. And you're unable to talk because? Right, right. Okay, is there someone in the room with you? Just say yes or no. Yes. Okay, and now you get it. And again, around about here. At 21, the caller again does this thing where they start talking, not at the point of turn-taking precisely, but in overlap. And that, the, the turn-taking itself, the very machinery of conversation is the thing that is her resource for making these words, which are all about pizza, sound like something else. Uh, how do you do that? How do you manage to talk about, I'm in danger, I'm going to be killed by my partner who is here, uh, how do you get help? And this is, this is how you do it. And this emergency dispatch person managed to, of course, send the police vehicle and, and save the caller. So it's just so gorgeous for listening and for timing of turns and the way they're taken and how we can manage to communicate something which is about something else entirely using the words that mean something else entirely. Okay. Final clip, different setting, lighten the mood, it's nearly at the end. This is somebody phoning the vet, okay? They're phoning a vet and they just want to find out something about a service for their, their animal. Good afternoon. And what I want you to think about as this call comes out is if you were training the vet receptionist to do good things, and you can see in an instance of something good in this call to just think about what it would be that you would recommend that they, they do regularly. Good afternoon. I got a new puppy the other day. Just wondering how much it costs to get the jabs done, please. Of course, yeah, let's have a look for you. What was um, the breed? The puppy that you had? Oh, it's just a crossbreed, Carly Cross. Oh. So you might be thinking that it's relevant to the cost of jabs, what type of animal it is, and if it's a dog, what size it is and weight and so on. So you might be thinking, well, you can ask what the breed of the dog is, and then you can get the information and then move on and just give the price. Or you can do what this vet receptionist does, because really it doesn't matter what the answer is. Uh, of type of dog. You can always say, oh, because everyone loves their pets. So it doesn't matter what answer to the question is, you can always say, oh, <laughs> and built in rapport, in inverted commas, uh, with the caller. So you might be thinking that. And you'd be wrong. And I'm really messing with you now, because there is no cute collie cross because this is a mystery shopper who doesn't really have a dog. And they're phoning to test out the skills, or otherwise, of the receptionist. Now, the receptionist doesn't know that this is a mystery shopper. You don't know if you're ever going to be mystery shopped in your role. But it is a mystery shopper. And, of course, mystery shoppers don't do the things that people with real pets do, like say that they've got a sick pet and make an appointment which is really common when you look at what people are really doing when they phone up. And so what you have is this strange situation where people phone up and mostly they just want to know about cost. And then they resist all attempts of help from the receptionist who says, would you like me to book you in? No, I don't really have a dog. <laughs> that, would be, that would be bad. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because I do think, well, what kind of report are they going back to the organisation with when you're not doing the things that someone who actually has a pet does. And so, just one final interesting, gorgeous, nerdy detail about mystery shoppers and real clients. And that is, 
we tend to think that things like er uh and um are errors in talk, that we shouldn't say er uh and um, and that they are mistakes, disfluencies, we should get rid of them. Now, I'm hoping that you've seen by now that er uh and um is totally normal. They're everywhere in our talk. Hesitation starts, restarts, and it's the constant maintenance of shared understandings, and we're constantly fixing our talk. But it turns out that if you are a mystery shopper, your errs crop up in a different place than if you've really got a dog. So if you are a mystery shopper, you say things like, I've just got a new d uh, puppy. Or I want to know how much you charge for uh, puppy vaccinations. Whereas if you do really have an animal, you do it like this. I need to make an appointment to bring the cat in to get its um, updated vaccinations. And it's a slightly different type of um, and it's in a different place. And I just bought a puppy on Sunday, um, and she's got a bad eye. We, we do it differently when we have a stake in the encounter, and you cannot know that. You cannot act it. You cannot simulate that. It just turns out that when you've really got a, an animal, your errs are in a different place than when you don't really have an animal, and you're phoning for service. And who'd have thought it? So I'm hoping that you have learned a lot about talk, that words do matter. We all think words matter, but now that you've seen words really do change outcomes of encounters. And that's it. Thank you.